Good morning, everyone. I see that Dr. Schwenk, you're joining us right now. Welcome. Um, we're going to go ahead and wait uh, just a minute or so uh, to get started uh, as people are still in the midst of hopping on the call. So uh, first of all, I just want to introduce myself once again. I'm Christine Brown, the Director of Member Engagement here at the Chamber. And it's a pleasure to see uh, so many of you here and to have so many of you coming and attending these calls as we're hosting them and as we will continue to host them for, uh, for the months ahead. Um, the whole point of these calls is to educate and to inform and to make sure that our members are equipped with the very best in information, um, the very best in access to, uh, to policymakers, um, to those who are uh, in positions of influence in our community. And, and we believe strongly, especially in this climate now more than ever, uh, that equal access and, um, and, uh, and supplying our members with an opportunity to be educated is one of our primary values. So it's in that spirit that I want to thank all of you for showing up today and for continuing to show up. And it's our commitment to keep showing up for you. Uh, so again, really quickly, um, we're going to be taking um, perhaps some live questions at the end of the call. Um, if you have any questions that come up um, in your mind during the call, just enter them into the chat. Um, that would be great, and we will try and address as many of them as possible after the call, uh, or at, at the end of the call, rather. Um, so uh, with that, I want to welcome again uh, Dr. Schwenk. Um, he's the Dean of UNR School of Medicine, um, and he's joining us today to talk, about, to, talk to us about myriad issues. Um, but two of the primary issues that he's going to be discussing with us today are research efforts at, uh, at the university in regard to COVID-19 um, and also where, uh, where testing stands in Nevada at this time. Uh, he was with us uh, a couple weeks ago, maybe five or six weeks ago for one of our first Ask the Expert calls. And so it's great to have you on again, doctor. Um, pleasure to see you again today. Hi, Christine. Nice to see you. Nice to see all of you. I recognize a few names on the the list. It's good to be back with you. Awesome. Well, we will go ahead and just jump right in because I believe it's 1101 right now. And so we want to make the most of our time with you. Uh, so go ahead. I know that you have some things that, that you'd like to open up with. So please go ahead and share what's on your mind. Great. Thanks, Christine. Let me do this. Let me do a, a kind of a lightning round of, of a number of hits on sort of the scientific issues um, that we are tracking with regard to testing and treatments and vaccines. Um, and then I'll come back to the questions that you sent to head, Christine, um, and try to knock off uh, several of those. Uh, some of them are difficult or don't have uh, obvious answers, but I'll do my best to kind of run through those. And I think that'll leave us time for 10 minutes or so at the end for <clears throat> questions from the group um, uh, that are signed on. So let me just uh, run through some quick issues. Uh, with regard to testing, as you know, State Public Health Lab uh, is responsible for a lot of the testing, but actually a lot of private testing resources have uh, stood up in both uh, Northern Nevada and in Southern Nevada. Nevada continues to test at a very high rate uh, and probably uh, as well or better uh, than most states in the country, but it's still, uh, I think, somewhat inadequate in, in terms of our long-term strategy, which is really testing everyone and having uh, a very extensive contact tracing system in which every positive test leads to investigations uh, that will reveal who else may be positive so we can really track these things down. That's the standard epidemiologic approach for any infectious disease. Now we're standing up antibody testing, and again, that's available both with the state public health lab and privately. There's a fair bit more controversy about antibody testing, <clears throat> and there are couple sources of that controversy. One is that not all uh, testing systems have been approved for emergency use authorization by the FDA, um, their EUA authorization. And uh, there are literally a hundred testing systems out there, most of which have not been approved. There's a lot of concern about uh, both false positives and false negatives that lead to different sorts of confusion. Uh, the State Public Health Lab has a, a system, the Abbott system, with emergency use authorization. And we have a modest number, a few thousand tests that will be used to kind of validate the system. We're going to use this in some high-risk populations, some healthcare worker populations. But beyond all the uh, testing issue is the issue of what does it mean? 
So antibodies uh, form to coronavirus and there's an IgM antibody, which is kind of the short phase, the early reactor kind of comes on fast and, and then fades. And there's IgM, which is the long-term antibody. And most tests test only for IgM. I'm sorry, test only for IgG. And so um, we are testing for long-term antibodies, but what we don't know is what that means in terms of clinical immunity. So you can get a positive test. That means you've had the disease, you've responded to the disease, you've developed long-term antibodies, but we don't know what that means uh, in terms of um, long-term clinical immunity. And that has to be sorted out and we're contributing to that, but uh, that's a, a long-term process. Let me move on quickly. So uh, treatments, there's um, uh, some interest in uh, uh, remdesivir, which is the antiviral treatment that um, um, comes out of Gilead. It's been used for other viral infections. Studies did show some shortening of the illness. It's not really impressive, not a real game changer, but it's been used to try to shorten the illness in some patients. Hydroxychloroquine has been looked at both as a an ICU type treatment for very serious patients, as well as more of a preventive, hasn't performed well in any of those settings. So the, the interest continues to fade in uh, hydroxychloroquine. And there's not a whole lot else that's cooking out there at the moment. The real hot issue, of course, is convalescent plasma. Uh, so this is a, an ages old treatment. It actually goes back to the late 1800s. It was used for diphtheria when there was no other treatment for diphtheria. And you would take plasma from patients who had been uh, sick and recovered uh, because not all patients died with diphtheria. And you would um, uh, uh, draw that out. In, in those days, it was actually blood, uh, not just plasma. Now uh, we take the plasma and give, give the donor back their red blood cells. And uh, as I understand it, uh, any infusion or any collection of plasma from a patient who um, has um, had COVID and recovered can treat uh, two other patients. And it clearly works, um, but it's a question of the adequate number of donors, how to characterize those donors. Some donors are very high antibody producers, some donors not so much. Um, you have to um, match the blood type, uh, of course, because there's a, a blood incompatibility issue baked into this. Renown and um, UNR Med and the public health lab are studying uh, convalescent plasma and in soliciting donors and trying to explore the, the value of this. Um, vaccines, of course, probably a hundred different vaccine projects developing. It's pretty likely that more than one vaccine will be developed, more than one vaccine will likely work, more than one vaccine will likely be approved. There are vaccines being developed for both the uh, protein, which is the spikes you see on the pictures, um, and most vaccines in general are developed against the uh, proteins in a, a virus or a bacteria, but there's also vaccine being looked at against the RNA that's inside the virus, and that's a whole different approach. There's a suggestion that that could be developed more quickly than vaccines against proteins, but the issue with vaccines is still the need to administer the vaccine to um, a large group of patients and see what happens and that takes time. So the time issue to some extent is still fixed in terms of how long it takes to see what kind of response you get and how patients uh, fare when they receive the vaccine. So I wouldn't look for anything until um, well after the, the first of the year despite um, some of the, the comments about that. Ultimately, this whole issue gets solved with herd immunity. You have to have 60 or 70% of the population immune by one means or another, meaning had the disease and recovered or received a vaccine that was effective. Um, and when you get to 60 to 70%, then you have um, um, sort of sh a short circuited the transmission. You cannot transmit as much um, from person to person when most of the population is immune. So the, uh, the community transmission kind of fades. Um, and it's gonna be, I think, some time before that's the case. Um, for that reason, we're concerned about a surge this fall. It's not clear if this is a seasonal virus yet. It may be, except that we're seeing this um, pop up in uh, warm weather places, uh, which is a little um, concerning. And um, then it will fade and then perhaps come back again in the, in the fall. So uh, it's a little unclear what this is gonna do seasonally. Um, but ultimately, um, it's herd immunity that's going to solve this.
Let me hit, uh, Christine, jump on some of the questions. Uh, a lot has happened since we last spoke. What, what have been some of the biggest changes you've observed in the last six weeks? Um, I think that um, the curve has flattened. What's not clear is whether the area under the curve has changed. And so flattening the curve is critical from the healthcare perspective because you, you want to try to um, lower the huge surge, which can overwhelm healthcare facilities. But as states start to open back up and you get exposures, what you see in the news is what you would expect to see, which is you get these little hot spots popping up. And so a community will open up and then you'll get an event or a church or stores or a pool or something, and you get a huge amount of transmission. And, um, and so you get little hot spots that show up. So maybe the virus is just inevitably going to work through a community and those who get sick and recover will be fine. Those who um, uh, are asymptomatic, of which there's a fair reservoir, who are positive, they've been exposed, but they're asymptomatic, they'll be fine. And some people will still suffer a very serious uh, illness. So I think um, the issue here is that the um, um, social distancing and the masking does work. But what it does is to sort of temporize, it buys us time until we can either develop treatments or develop vaccines or some other way that herd immunity will uh, develop. It's not clear that it changes the long-term course. And so when we kind of relent in some of our restrictions, um, we really have to um, have, I think, a more uh, higher level social commitment to masking and to some of the other um, uh, hand washing and hygiene and other restrictions that we've talked about. Uh, we've heard from Kevin Dick um, with the health district uh, that we've had the highest incidence of new cases in the county in 20 to 29 year olds. Uh, what is my biggest concern about that? Yeah, so this is an issue. I actually am concerned about some of the media coverage and I won't point any specific fingers. But I'm concerned at the way we tend to emphasize the fact that the victims, especially those who die, are older and have underlying medical conditions. There are still young people who are dying. Some of them do indeed have underlying medical conditions. Some do not. What's really scary about this virus is the incredible widespread way that it hits people. So you have this huge reservoir of people, could be 20 or 30 percent of um, patients who are positive have no symptoms whatsoever. And then on the other end, you have this incredibly intense and severe illness that occurs in which you get these um, um, immune storms, these cytokine storms where your, your body just kind of overwhelms itself with the immune response to, to the virus and everything in between. Um, uh, so it bothers me when, when I hear from many young people, 20-somethings, 30-somethings, that they don't have to worry about this. This is just the cold. It's just not true. Uh, now, is it a big number? No, but it's a, definitely a serious number. Uh, there's a question about the multisystem inflammatory syndrome, MISC, in children. Uh, this is a kind of late breaking news. There are only, to my understanding, 100 or 150 cases in the country. I do not know of any in Nevada, but I could, I could be wrong. It's possible that there um, has been one or two. This seems to be kind of a variant on that cytokine storm that I talked about where you get this intense, overwhelming immune reaction that actually goes specifically to blood vessels in children. So you get some uh, really serious uh, blood vessel complications. Um, it's been compared to Kawasaki syndrome, which is a similar kind of blood vessel attack, um, but it has some differences as well. Um, Fairly little is known, but what is known is that you have to fight the immune response. You have to suppress the immune response to try to get it under control. Now switching gears, uh, share preliminary thoughts about UNR's plan for fall instruction. So as you know, uh, President Johnson uh, is very committed to de developing safe and, and, and uh, effective practices for having some return to campus. Um, the provost and the president uh, and the deans are developing various approaches to um, a mixed model of teaching where really large classes will still be virtual, smaller classes may be a mixed virtual and in-person, and even smaller classes will be in-person. Um, there's a lot going on in terms of uh, facilities changes and structuring the classrooms and training the faculty up in various types of virtual teaching. I think the hope for UNR is that they 
test this out with the second half of the summer semester. So that starts mid July and kind of test out a number of these things for the fall um, uh, start and in a much larger uh, number of classes in the fall. Uh, there's a lot to work on in that regard, but we're making progress. I think that we're getting there, uh, but uh, there's just a tremendous amount of meetings and conferences and emails going out and, and webinars and all sorts of things that are happening to try to train everybody up and to do all the right things so that we can be safe and can come back together. Medical school is kind of a microcosm of that. Our numbers, of course, are much smaller. Uh, we already have designed some approaches to anatomy lab, histology lab, microbiology lab, ACLS training, um, student outreach clinic, uh, some other types of um, sort of quasi-clinical activities where we really do have to be together and we're figuring out ways to do that. Then there are sort of the more normal classes, which will be um, in person, but with um, some continued online teaching so that students can stay home if they feel comfortable. You've got issues of students who may have fac uh, family members at risk at home or they themselves might be at risk. Uh, so we're working through some of those issues. A uh, lot of work, but I think we're making uh, progress. Uh, there's a question about university departments contributing to the response. Um, uh, we have medical students who continue to volunteer, but they're going back to their um, clinical uh, clerkships next Monday. Uh, so they'll be somewhat less available to volunteer, but between our medical students and our PA students, I think we were well over 4,000 hours, maybe we're over 5,000 hours now of volunteer activity with testing and counseling, uh, working with Elko County, working with the school district, uh, working with the city of Sparks. And we've done a lot of um, good work there. Uh, we've had uh, the engineering departments who've been working on 3D printing. And, and some PPE development. I don't know a lot about that, but I know that they were very enthused about um, contributing uh, to that. Um, update on our role in research. We have a lot to report there. So I already talked about the convalescent plasma study. Uh, that's a, a UNR Med and Renown collaboration. Uh, some of our basic scientists are working on how the coronavirus affects um, the uh, loss of sense of smell. You've probably heard that loss of sense of smell is one of the markers for this virus. And uh, we have some people who are very expert in how um, the, the cells uh, and the olfactory system work, and they're working on that. We've got people working on um, some more immediate testing uh, capabilities. So not, not the kind of thing where you do a test and send it away for hours to days, but um, testing that's actually at the point of care. You do the test right at the point. Um, there are some machines that you've heard about in that regard, but there have been some concerns about the accuracy of those machines. Um, we are doing some work on uh, treatment as well, um, and there's a whole host of other things taking place with antibody testing and some other things. So there are actually a whole bunch of uh, studies taking place uh, related to COVID, but I think it's way too early to say much about results, which was also part of the question. Um, phase two, the governor's plan, advice to businesses. Um, I would say that as business owners, um, you really need to uh, read the CDC guidelines, read the scientific guidelines coming out from the governor's office. Uh, he has been well advised, I think, by his scientific advisory committees and by his um, uh, director of health and human services, by our director of the state health lab and others. And it all comes down to distancing and masking. Um, it really worries me uh, when I go out and I might um, have a, a shopping trip of some sort or I um, stop in uh, somewhere and I see fairly large numbers of people not masking and people clearly not taking this seriously. If I were a business owner, I would have some very strict guidelines for everybody masked, both your staff and customers, and at least some attempts at uh, distancing when at all possible. But a lot of this is going to come down to masking. And there, for very unfortunate reasons, it seems like masking has become a political partisan issue. It's not a political issue, it's a scientific issue. And I think we really have to be um, serious about that. Uh, employee health screening measures, temperature taking. Um, I think that's, that's something that's commonly recommended, something that's commonly done. I think it's a good thing. But remember, 
a lot of people who are positive are asymptomatic. So you can do all the screening you want. You can take temperatures. You can ask for symptoms. There are still going to be people who pass through all that screening, and they're still positive and theoretically contagious. Uh, the contagiousness is uh, still difficult to define. It's not clear how long after someone turns positive that they stay contagious. It might be just a matter of a few days. Their tests might persist a bit, but they might not be contagious at that point. So there's a lot being studied there. But um, I, yeah, I think that screening your employees would be fine. Screening your customers is really awkward and you're going to get into some difficulties there. But I think screening your employees would be good. Masking your customers would be good and distancing your customers uh, would be good. And here is the uh, $64,000 question. How safe do I personally feel out in public as uh, things are going right now. As I said, I'm a little concerned. I'm, to be completely um, fully disclosed, I am very careful. I go out very little. I go to the office from time to time. My wife and I um, have I had a little contact at a distance with friends uh, a couple times over the last few weeks. Um, we make very occasional forays to uh, the grocery store we're doing pickup for restaurants. We're not going to restaurants anytime soon. I'm sorry for those of you who have restaurants because I think that's a, a difficult place to control. We're not flying anytime soon. So just in being really disclosed, that's kind of where uh, I am. I'm not saying that's where you have to be, uh, but I think we got a lot to learn before we uh, completely open up our activities. Mm. So Christine, that's... Yeah. Uh, Quite a run. Uh, maybe I should uh, come <laughs> yes, back. Yes, I'll, I'll go ahead and jump in really quickly. Um, thank you so much for all of your comments and, of course, your candor. Um, I will certainly keep my comments to a minimum, but but only interject to say that here at the here at the Chamber of Commerce, we we fully believe in mask wearing out in public, in conducting business, and and we encourage all of our our members to uh, to not only continue to follow CDC guidelines as they're conducting business, but to encourage uh, the public to, to wear masks as they are conducting their business um, in, your, in your businesses. We, we know that commerce is only just now starting to pick back up um, with the phases of, of reopening that, that we're in right now. Casinos just opened up today, but all of this could come to a screeching halt if we don't take seriously the, the, public, the public health risk that, that is posed by, uh, by gathering together um, in these public spaces without uh, personal protective equipment. So, so please, please let's all take this seriously so we can keep moving forward and not see, um, not see any restrictions fall, fall onto us again. Um, and and we're, we're going to get through this somehow. Um, so we do have a couple great questions coming in through chat and I thank you so much to our members who are participating and, and doing so thoughtfully and conscientiously. Um, we'll go ahead and start with this question from Maureen Leary. Are you recommending that people not showing symptoms get the COVID-19 test now that they are available to everyone who should get it? Yeah, well, ideally everybody should get the test and that's where we have to be. It's gonna take a while to get there and we're sort of going in tiers, kind of going in layers. Um, people initially it was people who were really sick now people who are moderately sick eventually we'll get to people who are mildly ill and eventually get to, to everyone um, so the, the ultimate answer to to her question of who should get it the answer is everybody we're not there yet but we are working our way down the, the chain to less and less severely affected people uh, Gordon is asking some extremely complicated questions he clearly has a, a background uh, in this, uh, and I have to apologize, I'm not expert in some of these public health um, numbers, uh, so I can't answer um, all the questions that I see there. Um, but yes, there is a minimum level of testing that would start to um, uh, stimulate the contact tracing that would take us in the right directions. So if you think about this, you could just go around and test everybody, or you could test sort of selected groups that seem to be more at risk or seem to be ill, and those would generate kind of a higher return, if you will, which would then lead to contact tracing and lead to more, um, a more targeted set of patients to, um, to test. And that, that's really where we'd like to be, even though ultimately we'd really like to test everyone. Um, 
And I don't know the numbers as to what, what's required or what would be the best, uh, uh, best number. I'm certainly happy to look into that and um, see, uh, and also the question of total positive tests completed uh, by contact tracers um, compared to, to numbers of tests. Uh, what you've heard, I think, is that our uh, rate of positives is going down, and that's a good thing because you assume that we're starting to tap into some higher risk populations or tapping into populations that are more ill. And so the rate, it, the fact that the rate is going down means that there are less of those. So that's a good thing, um, but we're not there yet. Right. But thank you, Gordon. I'll, I'll dig into some of those public health things. Those are, those are excellent questions. Yes, they are. And, and if you have those answers and provide those to me via email, we will pass those along to, yeah, let me uh, see. to our members. I, my guess is that uh, somebody like Trudy Larson, um, our Dean of Public Health, or um, Dr. Pandori can give me some answers. So I'll, I'll dig into that. Fantastic. There's a question here about um, hyperimmune globulin, which I like a lot, because that's very closely related to the uh, convalescent plasma issue uh, and almost uh, you know, a, a very close cousin. Um, hyperimmune globulin is sort of less specific, but higher levels of uh, antibodies. And so you get very concentrated amounts of antibodies, not all to COVID, but lots of antibodies to everything. And convalescent plasma is sort of the same, except you're targeting people who are known to have been sick, who are known to have high levels of uh, coronavirus antibody, and using that plasma in a more targeted way. But the two are, for most practical purposes, the two are essentially identical. And again, um, there are lots of ex experience over, over many years with many different diseases with hyperimmune uh, globulin. We do IgG for a lot of infectious disease situations. So this is just kind of one more example of that, except it's sort of concentrated uh, to have higher levels of the um, antibody. Now, there's a question here that, again, I don't know the answer about the specific Abbott test that LabCorp is using for antibody testing, but I can find out about that. Um, Fantastic. That would be intensely helpful. Yeah. Um, another another quick question um, about the potential for, well, potential for and expected uh, COVID-19 surge that could be coming in the fall. Yeah. Uh, you know, Renown came out and, and said that they are expecting a surge in the fall. And of course, that will run in tandem with what we already expect uh, in terms of our flu season. So, uh, you know, the, the stress on our medical system could, could be even more intense at that time. Do you have any comments on that? Yeah, I think we're all worried, uh, but I think we don't know yet how worried to be. I'm worried about some of the loosening of restrictions and then people kind of interpreting that loosening in their own way. So you can get some, some certain guidelines at a state level or a community level, and then people, what they hear is, oh, everything's fine, kind of back to work, back to school, back to restaurants, back to large group events. And that's not what many of these guidelines say. They're very careful in terms of what is allowed and what's not. And, but if we sort of blow through that in our social behavior, um, you're gonna start to see uh, some uh, resurgence of community transition, transmission. And if that runs into what's a seasonal issue, uh, then you've got uh, kind of a convergence of two major uh, forces, and then of course influenza comes into that as well. Um, so I think we are worried, and I'm worried socially because it it seems to me that it was really pretty dramatic the way the country shut down. And you can agree or disagree with how that was done, but it happened, and it was fairly dramatic. And now that and and people stayed shut down for you know most of three months plus or minus. Now we're coming out of that. And if there's a huge surge and there is a need or a desire to shut down again, I think that's going to be extremely traumatic to society as a whole and to businesses and to schools and to healthcare and all sorts of things. So doing it once is one thing, but, but kind of loosening up and maybe loosening up too much and then getting hit again and shutting down as we get into the winter uh, could be an extremely complicated and extremely painful process. And so I'd, I'd hope that we would have kind of a more gradual approach here and not get too carried away. Right. It, it does seem that at least, at least for now, the, the best path we can imagine is to be 
is, is to allow commerce to resume in, in some form or fashion, of course, adhering to CDC guidelines, but on a personal level for each of us as individuals to take the public health risk seriously. I'll and say to again exercise that, uh, an abundance of caution um, as individuals as well. I'll say again that um, the issue of masking and social distancing is really a temporizing issue. It's trying to keep control, kind of keep the lid on until we get to a vaccine. Everything that we're doing is, is to get us to a vaccine, um, which leads me to a comment. I, I saw a study the other day that um, caused me concern. Something like 31% of people said that uh, even when a vaccine is available, they're not sure they would get it. And uh, I just was stunned by that because um, I don't know why we wouldn't Mm. take advantage of that. Mm. Here's a question we might end up on, Christine. I've heard masking with cloth masks doesn't help prevent the virus. Only N95s are true. This is a really hot topic. You guys ask uh, really complicated questions. Mm -hmm. So um, here, here is the kind of the science such as we understand it. Homemade cloth masks, you know, double layer, different cloths, this and that, are not as good as surgical masks. Surgical masks are not as good as N95s. None of them are perfect. And so, yes, N95s are better. Here's a problem with N95s. They have to be fitted. Many people are not fitted properly. Most of the N95s you see have not been fitted at all. People just got them and slapped them on their face. Um, and if it's not fitted properly, then they're no better than surgical masks. Personally, I just like to see a mask on everybody. I, I'm not quite so concerned about how effective. The issue with the transmission is twofold. There's aerosolization, which is the real microscopic particles. They go through everything. And then there's droplets. What the masks do is solve the droplet issue. So when we talk and breathe and spit and whatever, the masks solve that. Um, whether, whether a cloth mask solves the aerosol problem is, is a different question, but it helps me. Maybe it's just optics, but I would just like to see everybody in a mask. That's all. Right. I think that's fair. Um, and I think just really quickly when it comes to testing, since there is a difference between testing for the active virus uh, and its presence in, in, in someone's immune system versus the antibody test, uh, do you recommend that businesses pursue uh, antibody testing for their employees as they're considering whether or not to, to allow employees to come back to work? Well, remember that antibody testing will only tell you that someone's had the disease or been exposed. Mm -hmm. it, we do not know yet that it tells us if they're immune and therefore safe. This immunity passport issue does not work here. Uh, so the antibody test will tell you if they've been exposed. One would assume that if one's been exposed and recovered, that they are less likely to transmit, less likely to be in, in, uh, reinfected, and therefore somewhat safer, but you can't say that for sure. Um, if I were a business owner, I'd probably still be a bit more interested in the uh, testing for the virus itself because mm -hmm. I'd want to know I'd want to know more about the asymptomatic population that's positive and therefore truly infective versus patients who've been exposed and recovered but but may themselves still not be immune I worry that people will get antibody tests and, and feel like they're bulletproof at that point and that's not really justified so I'm still a little bit more interested on the on the uh, other side. Thank you so much. And that is a, that's a great place to leave it. And I thank okay. you again for, um, for speaking with us, for speaking with us honestly, um, and, for, and for giving us this information. I know that our, our business community needs to know the truth, uh, needs voices they can trust when it comes to uh, the public health risk uh, that we're facing and, and how to respond to it appropriately. So thank you again for hopping on this call with us. Uh, right. And you're always welcome back. We'll do it again in a few weeks. Yes, indeed. There, this, there's this always a, something to talk about. <laughs> this is a fast moving topic. Yes. Well, thank you again so much. And I wish you a good day. And um, everyone on the call, I wish you a good day as well. Thanks, Christine.